Well, good morning. How are you guys doing this morning? There's a thing that Mark Metkine, uh, that we love to say is, hey, how are you? Hey, how are you? It's good. So I'm excited to be here and share a message from God's Word with you. And so uh, before we get into that, just bow with me in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love and for your grace. And Father, you know that for many of us, we come to today already this morning, possibly distracted, some of us frustrated, some of us excited, some of us just illusioned. But Father, we pray that in this moment, your spirit would come upon us, that it would quiet our souls, that he would teach us, that he would minister to us, and he would do a work of grace in our hearts and our mind. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. And so I have two hours this morning, right, Pastor Brian? It's 1032. We're here till 4 o'clock. We got this. So, no, but I just want to start off and say I have to admit, church, that I have, in my Christian walk, I have had many moments where I have walked in defeat. Can you relate? I've been defeated in relationships. I've been defeated emotionally. I've been defeated spiritually. I've been defeated by the attacks of the enemy, which seems to never stop, right? I've been defeated in my wife and I in bringing a child into this world. I've been defeated at work in different places. I've been defeated in my finances. I've been defeated by bad leadership I see in the world and in society. And sometimes I'm just defeated by the storms of life. Just life in general at time is just plain awful. And what I'm trying to get at is that the Christian life is never easy. Jesus never said, place your faith in me and then everything will be gravy for the rest of your life. Faith in Jesus Christ does not guarantee us freedom from the pain and struggle that life brings in our way. And I know that there are times when I'm feeling defeated, that I ask this question, God, when is the victory coming? When are you going to bring the victory? When are you going to set me free? When can I experience the blessings you talk about in your world? Has anyone else in here felt the same way? You been there? You been there with me? Good. You ever felt beat up, messed up, jacked up? Yeah. It's part of being a Christian. Struggling against the grain, living life differently than the rest of the world, and it comes with pain and it comes with struggle. And I'm sure we've all had it. And many times in those moments, we sit back and we struggle saying, God, where are you? Have you abandoned me? Have you forgotten me? Have you, do you really see the pain that I am walking through? And see, we hear over and over again at church, we hear over and over again in God's word that God will bring the victory, that God will set us free, but then we sit back and say, God, where is it? You see, now how many of you will agree with me this morning with this statement, I am sick and tired of living in defeat, I'm ready to walk in victory. Anybody agree with me on that this morning? Okay, amen. And so this morning, we're going to unpack this because God has given us the ability and the freedom to walk in victory and no longer walk in defeat. And so here's the truth. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15, 13 through 23 this morning. So you could go ahead and turn there in your Bible. We'll also have it on the screens for you if you don't have a Bible this morning. But here's the truth I want you to write down in your notes, and this is what we're going to really hang on to today. I wrote it simply as this, live like you got it because you do. Say it again, live like you got it, because you do, okay, and we're going to unpack that this morning, and so as you're turning in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 1, I want to set the context, and we have to start in verse 13 of chapter 1 before we get into verse 15, and this is what the Apostle Paul says, he says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. First thing Paul reminds us as Christians is that we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. And a lot of us, we sat in churches and we say, we, we say to ourselves, oh, I know what that means. 
That means that my salvation in Christ is secure, and that means that because I'm sealed, I'll never lose my salvation. While that is true, that is not all that is true about being sealed by the Holy Spirit. There is more than, than just having our salvation secure that means that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. I would encourage you, go home and read Romans chapter 8 for yourself. But in Romans chapter 8, this is what the sealing of the Holy Spirit does for every believer. The Spirit has set us free from sin and death. Think about that. It has set you free from sin that you think has you trapped as a Christian. You're set free from that. Not only that, the Holy Spirit empowers us to live according to the Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us put to death the deeds of the flesh. The Holy Spirit has adopted us as children where we can cry out, Abba, Father, in other words, Daddy in heaven, be with me, help me, give me this victory. The Holy Spirit prays for us when we don't know what to pray for. So many times I pray things, and I, know, I don't know it, but I'm praying the wrong things. But the beauty of being sealed by the Spirit, the Spirit intercedes for each of us and says, Father, this is what Brad really needs. Do this work in his life. Not only that, but the Spirit, he ends this in chapter 8 where Paul says, the Spirit will never let anything or anyone ever separate you from the love of God. This is what it means to be sealed with the Holy Spirit. And Paul wants to remind us Christians that, look, you have this Holy Spirit who is inside of you, who is empowering you, who is for you, who is with you every step of the way. Even in the midst of your greatest pain, the Spirit is with you. He has sealed your life. And then he says he's going to give us the inheritance. He is the guarantee that we will get the inheritance God has promised us. And you can sit back and you say, well, what is that inheritance that God is promising to us? You see, Paul always has in mind the exodus, God's people living in bondage, living under a king who wasn't their God, struggling in pain and suffering, and God delivers them, takes them out of that land, journeys with them through the desert, providing everything that they needed so he would take them to the promised land where he would be their God and they would be his people and they would rule over that land and tell people how great their God in heaven is. And this is what Paul is saying to us. He's saying, look, Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection, accomplished the greatest exodus the world has ever seen, where he has brought us from death to life, where the sin that was punished, that we were going to be punished for, God took that, paid for it, delivered us from our sin and our idols so we could be his people and he would be our God and he would be with us as we journeyed in this life until he makes all things new. You see, the inheritance of God is not just us sitting back saying, well, it's, it's eternal life, and that means we're going to spend eternity in heaven, and that's the inheritance. While, yes, the inheritance means eternal life, we're not going to sit just in heaven till the end of time, sitting on clouds, playing harps, and doing that. The Scripture tells us that at the end of all times, when the age to come arrives, Jesus will make a new heaven, a new earth, and he will rule over this earth, and we, his people, will rule with him in this world. And gets this, he even says that we're going to rule over angels. This inheritance is not sitting back saying, oh, I'm just going to wait till I get to heaven and I'm not going to do anything. No, 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 no. Our inheritance is glorious, it's amazing, and it is still yet to come, and we get to rule over God's new creation just as the Father in heaven intended from the beginning. This is our inheritance. This is what we long for. But knowing that's our inheritance, Paul wants us to remember that knowing that day, day is coming, what do we do in the present? You see, each of us as believers, we can't sit back and just live our own life, individual life, sit in our rooms, just show up to church on our own, leave on our own, and don't do anything. For we have a responsibility. The moment you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you were put on mission. 
You were enlisted in God's army to usher his kingdom into this world, to go in and to push back the darkness, to tell people there's a God in heaven who loves you, to go to the poor, to go to the needy, to those who are struck, stuck in their addictions, to tell them there's a way out, there's freedom, there's a Father who loves you, it could set you free. This is our responsibility to continue the good work that Jesus began when he came and then he solidified through his death and resurrection. And Paul says, keep all of this in mind. And then we get to verse 15. Look at what verse verse 15 says. He says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Keep that in mind, prayers. Prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. And what Paul means by that is literally this, that you would know in your inner being this truth. That you ever known something to be true and you knew it, like you just could feel the truth of it in your body and you just, it affected your whole being? This is what Paul is saying, that this truth needs to be deep-seated and rooted in you so that you will be convicted of it and nothing would ever shake that away from you, that this truth would be so embedded, it's in your inner being, it's in every fiber of your body, and you would live it and you would embrace it and you would be convicted of it. This is what Paul is saying, to have the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you would know this in your inner being. And he goes on and says, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Paul starts it off and says, for this reason. What reason? The reason, the fact that we have been given an inheritance and while we are waiting for the age to come, Paul knew we had work to do And because he knew that we were each on a mission, he says these important words, I do not cease praying for you. You see, to live on mission for Christ, Paul knew that we were going to endure struggles. He knew it was going to be difficult work. He knew the world would hate our message. He knew the struggle that we would just walk through, just going through life in general. But because he knew that each of us need to stay on mission, Paul says, I will never stop praying for you because you are called to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And for you to do that, I can't stop praying for everybody else in this church. You see, we were never created to sit around and just wait for God to return. It is our responsibility to bring God's Love to a hurt and broke world. We're continuing his mission. Jesus came. He said it himself. He came to seek and save the lost. So you know what our mission is? To seek and save the lost. And for us to accomplish this task, it takes each of us praying for one another. You see, I titled the sermon today, Pray for Your Church. How are we ever going to stay on task? It's by us, me, praying for each of you. It's for you, praying for the people, each of, uh, everyone else in here, praying for one another, praying that they would stay on mission. Because, see, to live for God, we have to make a lot of decisions in life, right? And we need God's wisdom. And this is what Paul says. Man, I would pray that you would have the wisdom from God to make decisions that honor God. Make decisions that demonstrate obedience to Christ in this life. And he's, he knows for us to make those decisions, it's going to take God's wisdom. It's going to take God's wisdom to know how to navigate this culture and find ways to tell this culture God loves you. It's going to take God's wisdom for us to develop and say, okay, what can we do to reach our community? How can we meet the needs? What do we do with hunger? What do we do with people who have no clothes? God, give me the wisdom to understand. Give me the revelation to know what you've called me to do in this mission because each of us play different parts in this mission. We all don't do the same thing. And for you to know what that calling is and purpose is for you, your life, it takes each of us in here praying for you. You with me? 
And then he says this, that he would pray that they would have the knowledge of God himself. Because here's the truth. He prayed that they would know their Father in heaven, that they would know Jesus Christ. And the greater we know Jesus and the more we get to know Jesus, the more we live and act and love like Jesus. And this is what Paul says our prayer needs to be for everyone in this church, not just the people in your neighborhood. Pray it for your church, for everyone, everywhere, because Paul understood that the key to other believers' growth is our prayers for them. You can sit back and say, no, each Christian's growth is dependent upon themselves. No. Paul is saying the key for those Ephesians to continue to live in faith, to continue to love one another, and he calls them out. He says, look, you guys have been doing great. I've heard of your faith. I've heard of your love for one another. The scriptures say, Jesus told us, that the world will know we're your disciples if we love one another, and they're doing that. And he says, for you to continue to grow in that, I can't stop praying for you. In other words, the growth of the people sitting next to you in this seat is dependent upon your prayers for them. Yes, we pray individually. Yes, we pray and seek God. But when a community is bathing each other in prayer, it is going to see the power of God's Spirit at work in the community, which would then empower us to reach out and reach the lost and the hurt and the broken in our communities. But it takes prayer where we apply this and say, man, I'm going to commit to pray for those around me so they can grow and be all that God has called them to be. And when we do, we can begin to push back the darkness in our cities and in our communities. You see, we've been given an inheritance that will never fade. We've been sealed with the Holy Spirit who will help us and empower us to live out the mission that God has given to us. And yes, Along the way, it will be tough. Yes, along the way, you will have struggles. Yes, you will feel like you are facing defeat. Yes, you will feel like you've already been defeated. This is why Paul says, pray for one another. And I wrote down a couple questions in my notes, and I said it this way. Could it be that many Christians walk around in our church defeated because the church prays too little? Second question follows it up. Is it possible that because we pray too little, that makes our faith so brittle? How many people do you know whose faith is shook and almost broken because of the feats in life that they have faced and walked through? How many people are so close to giving up because they haven't seen God show this victory in their life? How many do you know? who over and over again, I just don't know, I've tried this God thing and it's not working. You know why? Because we're not praying for people as we should. And I'm guilty of it. When I studied this I, and God revealed this truth to me, I sat back going, wow, how have I missed this my whole entire Christian life? Because if we really grasp this in our inner being and we prayed this prayer for others and they grasped it in their inner being, my goodness, the gates of hell would not prevail against the church at Hollywood Community Church. And so many Christians walk around defeated because we're not praying for them to know the truth that we are unpacking today. Yes, we pray for the needs of people. Yes, when someone says, I have to go have a treatment or might pray for my grandparents, yes, we pray for that. We put those up to God. But Paul has given us something very specific for us to pray for, to say, look, if you would pray this in the lives of other Christians around you, it will help their growth and for them to live on mission and fulfill what God has planned for them. So here's what the statement, I'll I'll read it to you again. In Christ, we have access to his wisdom, his revelation, and we have access to a relationship with him. So live like you got it, because you do, church. Not only does Paul pray that saints would understand they have wisdom and revelation and they can get to know God, but then he gives them the real knowledge that he really wants them to focus in on and to really put into their heart and their mind. And if they really grasp this, it would change everything in their life. Look at Ephesians verse 19. 
And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. Starts in verse 19 and says, I wish they would know the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us. Everybody say power. power. Paul wants us to know the power that God has placed inside of us through his spirit. Because if they caught this and realize that we have access to this power on a daily use, it would set the church on fire. This doesn't mean we're going to become Harry Potter and do wizardy things, but it is the power that God gives us to defeat secret sins. It's the power to finally walk in victory over the temptation and sins of life. It is the power to fulfill our calling in God's world and his kingdom. It's this power where if we truly grasped it, we would walk in victory and not defeat. And see, what Paul wants us to understand, that what is true of the Messiah is true of us. What is true of him is true of you. And here's what he gets at. He says, when Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places. What what does he mean by that? Well, Jesus came, and through his death and resurrection, God elevated him to show, this is my Messiah, this is my son, and he is elevated over here. He has authority in this world to rule over it because he came, he lived the perfect obedient life that all of us as humans have failed to live, and he did it for us, and through his resurrection, God elevated him and says, he's in charge He's ruling. His rule is out there. And not only that, but he goes on and says that he has been given authority over every spiritual power, demon, Satan. He's been given authority over every human ruler. I don't care who we think is in charge as a human being on this planet. They're not. Jesus is in charge. He is not only in charge over the spiritual powers, he's in charge of everything. Any situation you walk through, he's ruling over it. He has authority over it, and his power is available to us every day, all day. And Paul says, I wish you would know it. You see, too many of us, we know it, but we don't know it. You with me? We read the truth, but we don't know it. And Paul wants us to know the truth so it impacts us, it changes us, and we live in that knowledge. And then Paul says that he has put everything, God has put everything under Jesus' feet. And this is a reference back to Psalm chapter 8. I encourage you to read that one too. But God had a purpose for us, his people. He said, man, I made these people special. Out of all the things I created, humans are the best. Just a little lower than the angels, but they're here. And they're going to rule over my creation They're going to reflect praise and glory back to me. But Adam and Eve, they sinned, they blew it, and we see what we have now. But then Jesus said, I'll do what they couldn't do. And through his obedient life, his death and his resurrection, Paul reminds us what God has done through Christ is he has made a new creation. Right? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed. All things have become new. What Paul is saying is, look, this is a return to our original purpose. Through Christ, with him having everything under his feet, we are now Jesus' hands and feet in this world, ruling with him and truly being the people of God that he's called us to be. We've been given our purpose back, and our purpose is to love God, love our neighbor as ourself, and point people to our Father in heaven. You see, what is true of Jesus is true as us, and I have to go into Ephesians chapter 2 because this is important. Look at what verse 5 says. This is talking about you as a believer in Christ. 
Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. We can't work it. We can't earn it. It's all by grace. But look at verse 6. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the what? What does it say? Heavenly places. We just saw where Christ was elevated in the heavenly places. What is Paul getting at? If you've truly understood the power that Christ has given you, we would truly be the people of God that is ruling in this world and reflecting praise and glory back to God and literally be in his hands and feet. We manifest God's love and presence in the world. This is how Christ is ruling. Can you go to City Hall, knock on it, and say, I'd like to meet with Jesus, please? He hasn't come visibly yet. How is he ruling in this world? Through his people, understanding their calling, their mission, and their purpose, trusting in the Spirit's power, saying, I'm going to go where you call me to go. I'm going to love the people that most of the world forgets about, and when I do, I can push back the darkness where I am. And this is what God's Spirit will give each of us the power to do. And Paul knew that in order for us to accomplish this and to know that power is available to us every day, it takes me and you praying for your church. And we can never stop praying for our church. When a moment you think, I don't need to pray for that person anymore, you need to pray for that person even more. Because this is what's going to allow us to know the power that God has given it and know it in our inner being. Not just know the facts of it, but know it for ourselves so that we can walk in victory and not walk in defeat. And Paul is summing this all up by saying, look, Ephesians, I want you to live like you got it because you do. The power is available to you every day. Paul says this in Romans 5, 17. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in, what does that word say? Life. Through the one man, Jesus Christ. What's Paul saying? Every believer, I want you to catch this, sin no longer reigns over you. Do we have a sinful nature? Yes. But through Christ, we are reigning in what? We are reigning in life. And the greatest trick the enemy has given to every believer is to get us to think that that sin we wrestle with has control over us. Jesus has defeated that sin, has defeated every idol in our life through his death and his resurrection. You have not been saved to be defeated. You have been saved to be victorious over sin in your life. Amen? But yet, there's many of us, we come to church and we hear we're sinners and we just begin to think, oh, oh man, I'm horrible, I'm just this evil, wicked person and I never do anything right. And then we begin to believe that and when we believe that, we stop trusting. We stop making decisions according to our faith, and we sit back and go, eh, I'm just going to wait till God delivers me. I'm waiting for him to give me victory over temptation. And then when he doesn't, well, I'm just not going to pray anymore. I'm not going to go to church anymore. I'm going to find another church where I can just do the exact same thing and go around and around and around. And this is why Paul says, but man, if you knew the power that lived in you. Every sin, temptation, storm, and struggle of life, if you knew God would give you the strength to overcome it every day, you would not walk around defeated. Amen? There's people I know that they will sit back and they think, I can't change. I can't defeat this situation. My addiction is too strong, can't break free from pornography, I can't fix my marriage, I'll never find a job, I'll never be happy, I'll never get along with a co-worker, I can never step out in faith and start an outreach in my community. These are all defeated mentalities. These are all things that Paul does not want us to hold on to. He wants us to know, no, no, no. You've been set free and you reign in life through the Spirit so you can do what God has called you to do. And he's telling us we need to live like we got it because we do. 
and start making decisions accordingly and praying, God, give me the wisdom. God, give me the strength. Through the rest of Ephesians, this is what Paul says we have the power over. We have the power to resist demons. We have the power to accomplish good works. We have the power to live in unity with people from other countries. We have the power to develop patience, humility, and gentleness. We have the power to lose our self-centeredness. We have the power to serve the body of Christ. We have the power to get rid of ungodly behaviors. And we have the power to develop healthy family relationships. The power is available to you and me Every day, if only we walked in it and knew it, church. But this is why prayer is important and why we don't cease. Because as we pray this for one another, God will continue to allow us to know it. And when we know it, we will walk in it, we will live it, and we will be a victorious life. You see, I had the honor of doing a funeral service for Gloria Garman a few months ago. And one of her family members came up to share during the testimony time. And she struggled with addiction for years. And she just couldn't overcome it. And so she said she was at Gloria's house one day and was sitting at the table. And Gloria walked by and had a toy helicopter and just put on the table and looked at her and said, Do you want rescue or do you want help? And then she walked away. And so she said she sat there like... That's it? It's the whole conversation? But then she realized what Gloria meant. So many of us are walking around defeated, waiting for God to rescue us. And then when God doesn't just rescue us, we think it's God's fault. But God always works in this way. God's not just going to rescue you. God's going to help you live victorious. And it takes you trusting him and trusting his power that's available to you every day. My own life, when I wrestled with pornography, I thought I was defeated, just something I'm always going to do. There was times I thought, oh, maybe just give in to it, just be done with it. But then I had people praying for me, and God made it real to me that, no, this pornography does not have control over me. And God just awoke in me one day to realize, no, I'm not stuck to this. I'm choosing to go back to this. I'm going back. I have the victory, and God made me know it in my inner being, and I began to make decisions to not go back to it through the Spirit's help. And God led me to a place of victory, and God can do the same in your life, whatever it is that is struggling where you're struggling today. And imagine, church, if we prayed this prayer for everybody at our church. Imagine if each of us, like the Apostle Paul's co-laborer, Timothy, the young man that he raised up, imagine if all of us understood that God has given us a spirit, not a spirit of fear, but one of power and of love and self-control. Imagine what we could do in our communities. And then the Apostle Paul says this, and we'll be done in just a moment. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul gives us one last charge this morning. He says this, the sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. Catch this. But thanks be to God who gives us the what? What does that say? The what? The victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And because he's given us the victory through Jesus Christ, and you have the victory today in Jesus Christ, he says, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Paul wants us to know in our being that we are victorious so that we continue the work that God has given to us to do. Ephesians 2.10 says we are God's masterpiece. We are created in Christ Jesus, and he has given each of us good works to do that he planned before the foundation of the world And this is what Paul is telling us. You have, through Christ, the victory to accomplish those good works. Walk in victory, not defeat. And so imagine the difference we would make here on 441 and Taft Street if we knew this. Well, it's going to take you and I praying for every believer in this church without ceasing, without stopping, always praying that we would understand this truth, that the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in 
us. It would change us and it would change our communities. And so I'm going to give you three things. It'll be on the screen for you as well. How do I practically pray? Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. First of all, pray that you would know the power available to you in Christ. God, make it real. Help me to know it. Secondly, pray that others in your church would know the power available to them in Christ. And third, never stop praying this prayer for your church, where we can sit back like the Apostle Paul and say, I do not cease to give thanks to you. I remember you always in my prayer that you would know, that you know, that you know that the power of Christ lives in you, and you would use it and walk in it. And so before we take the Lord's Supper today, I would like to do something just a little unique. If you're comfortable, I'm not forcing anybody, but I would like to just turn to the neighbor next to you, and I would just like you to just take a moment to pray this prayer over them and for them to pray this prayer over you so we could practically pray this out. If it's somebody on either side of you, it doesn't have to be just two. It could be bop, bop, bop. It could be the row, whatever it is. But I just want to give a moment for us to practically pray this prayer that we would know the power that God has given in us to put us on mission. And then after that, I'll close this out in a word of prayer. You with me? So go ahead, take a couple moments to pray for one another. Father in heaven, I pray that each of us would know the power that you have placed inside of us. Father, help us to experience it because once we experience it, man, we are changed and we will live it and we will be convicted of it. Father, I pray for each person in here that as a believer, she would strengthen them that whatever situation they find themselves in, that they can walk victorious because you've given them the power to live a victorious life. Father, I pray that we would take this challenge to heart and every day pray this prayer over the lives of our church family. Not for our glory, not for our honor, but we pray it so that we could tell the world about your glory, about your honor, about your love, and about who you are as a heavenly Father. Do in us what we can't do for ourselves. And Father, we give you all the praise and glory forevermore. Amen.